Tonight, uh, what I really want to do is want to look at a passage in 2 Peter chapter 1, titled the message, if you keep track of those things, it's, it's just one word, it's the word remember. And it's, it's not about you remembering me and Diana, it's not about us necessarily remembering you, I mean all those things are great and nice, and we hope those things happen, but that's not the essence of this message. There are far more important things that we need to be remembering. You know, there are times when it's very wise to have a long memory. I can still tie my shoes. Do you know that there are kids today that don't know how to tie shoes? They, 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 here's what they have. It, when our kids were going through school, it was Velcro. You know, save all that stuff. You don't have to tie your shoes, just do the Velcro thing. You know what it is now? They have the shoes that, they have strings in them, but they're not tied and you're not supposed to tie them. They just hang off the ends. You know, and I, said, I guess that's real cool. You just slide them on your feet, and it looks like you got tie-on shoes, but nobody ties anything anymore. I can still remember how to tie shoes, and I will tell you, in my closet, that's important. Uh, it's, it's important. You know, it's good to have long-term memory when it comes to riding a bike. I still ride a bike, not as much as I used to, but I do enjoy riding a bike. And, uh, you know, they say that once you learn to ride a bike, you can never forget. I have frankly seen some people out there that probably have forgotten but you know it's it's nice when you get on that bike and you get out there that, that you know you, you can still remember how to do it um it's always good to remember the way home you know it's not you know it's good to have that memory so you can get home but there are also times listen to me now there are times when it's wise to have a short memory anybody in this room married hey you know what i'm talking about you know there are times when it's just smart to have a short memory what i don't remember that honey you know it's just it's just it's just wise you know sometimes things said in haste it's best just just forget it okay just forget it didn't mean anything anyway uh, sometimes people can say things that that can be hurtful but we didn't really mean it so just forget it just forget it guys uh how about mistakes on the job, okay? I've made some mistakes on the job. Not a lot because I was able to retire after 40 years with ABF, so if I'd have made too many mistakes, that wouldn't have happened. But, you know, you, you make mistakes, you learn from it, you move on, and you forget it. You don't live in that stuff. Um, it, I, I watch professional football. I admit to that, okay? Um, and, and any good coach will tell you, that the, one of the things they try to tell their players is, look, if you mess up, you have a bad play, get it out of your mind. We've got another play that's being run right now, and you've got to forget about those things. It's good sometimes to have a short-term memory. And there are times, I will say this, there are times when it's wise to yield to the memory of somebody else. Because your memory may not be 100% accurate. And listen, you got a 50-50 chance of your memory being correct and the other person's being wrong. You have a 100% chance of being good if you defer. And sometimes it's just wise to yield to the memory of other people. But generally speaking, generally speaking, memory is a good thing. You know, I, I think it's a very human thing. Now, I know that, uh, you know... I, Animals have a degree of memory. We know, we know that. And they can remember their way home, and, and they remember certain things, uh, you know, things that you like, and, and, and the ones that like you to sit on their lap, and the ones that say, please don't do that, that kind of stuff. Animals have memories. We know that. What we don't know is, do they have the same kind of memory that humans have? And, and by that, do they remember their childhood? Do, do, do they remember their siblings? Do they remember their culture? Do they have a culture? Do they remember the things that happened in the world when they were younger? We don't know that. I think memory is one of those distinctively human things because we have all of that. We don't just remember how to tie shoes and ride a bike. We remember stuff about who we are, where we've been, things that happened in our lives. And, and memory is a very important thing. You know, the, 
the fear of losing memory is a very scary thing. I don't need to see a show of hands, but my guess is there are people in this room that know what it's like to be around a loved one who has struggled to remember. And it's sad. I mean, it breaks my heart. I've been in, Mike, Steve, you guys have been, Paul, you guys have been in hospitals just like I have. And you've seen it, and you know what it does, not just to the person, but to the family. When somebody says, well, she's doing okay, but she doesn't know me. The loss of memory is a very, very sad thing. Some things in life are too important for those those of us who have the capacity to remember, to not remember. And I fear that sometimes, in this modern world in which we live, we use too much of our memory capacity on the things that don't matter, and perhaps, perhaps, not enough on the things that do matter. Who we are, what we believe, what our priorities are. Now, our beliefs in spiritual matters largely come because we read the Bible. But if we read the Bible and we don't remember what the Bible tells us, we're losing something. We must, as Christians, I'm just saying, okay, I'm only talking to Christians in the room, okay? As Christians, we must always remember who we are, what we believe, and why we believe it. We can't forget these things in the busyness of life. Some things are just too important, and we must remember these things. Peter, in his second epistle, he's writing late in his life, as we shall see, probably possibly even in his last days. And it's not, you know, some great theological theme that he writes about. But what he says is what's important is that you remember the things that you already know that are important. That's what we're going to look at tonight very briefly. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is truth. Help us to never forget that. Help us to value your word, to guard it in our hearts, in our minds, that we may always be able to reflect on your word, recall your word, and apply your word to the lives that we live. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, the very first thing, and, and we're in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, I'm going to start... Uh, really in verse 12, but before we get to verse 12, I've got to back up a little bit, and here's why, because in verse 12, Peter says this, for this reason, well, what reason, Peter? So it kind of has to throw us back a little bit. For this reason, what reason are you talking about? Here's what he's talking about. He's at the very beginning of his letter, he's saying, look, uh, we've been saved. We have precious promises. We are partakers of the divine nature. We've escaped the corruption of the world. This is the true nature of the Christian. These things are true. These are past tense. They either are or they are not true of Christians. He says, well, this is where we are. And so if this is the case, if this is the case, then we need to add diligence. We have to give diligence to our faith and to our faith virtue and to our virtue knowledge, to our knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness love. we got to do these things, okay? And he says, for if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, if, he, if you do these things, that you're supposed to be doing, and you don't forget to do these things, then you're going to bear fruit. And, and, and you're, going to, you're going to grow in the likeness of Jesus Christ, which is what our calling is. Our calling is not to be church attenders. I like church. I've preached in churches. I've pastored churches. I think we should go to church. 
But our calling is not to be church attenders. It's to be fruit bearers. For he, listen, in verse 9, for he who lacks these things is what? Short-sighted. You're missing something. You're forgetting something. That's what short-sighted means. I used to know that. It used to matter. But I've forgotten those things. He who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness. As for God, and here's the thing, now get this. This ought to grab you. Forgetting that he has been cleansed from his sins. Christianity has become my religion. And if we lack these growing principles in our lives, here's what we've forgotten. We have forgotten that we were sinners saved by grace. We have forgotten that we were on a road to hell and we were saved, rescued as it were, just in the nick of time because of what Jesus did on the cross. Two hands. We can't afford to forget that stuff. Therefore, for this reason, Verse 12, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent, this human body, to stir you up by what? By reminding you, knowing that shortly I, speaking of, this is Peter now, I must put off this tent just as our Lord Jesus has showed me. He knows he's got a limited amount of time left on planet Earth. He knows this. He's probably in a Roman jail. He's probably awaiting the final verdict to come down from the emperor who says, this guy is a troublemaker, let's kill him. Troublemaker because he refused to bow to the emperor. Wasn't a bad citizen. Matter of fact, in 1 Peter, you go back, he talked about being a good citizen. But there was a line in the sand, and the line says, I'm not going to cross that line. I'm not going to bow down to the emperor. And that made him treasonous. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Hence, the letter that we have in our Bibles. You see what he says? This is important to him. He said, look, I only got a little bit of time left. What I'm telling you is, I'm going to keep reminding you of the things that are essential to being a Christian in today's world as long as I can. Because when I'm gone, I'm gone. You know, there's this, why does does my mind go to songs all the time? I don't know. This is not a Christian song, Steve. Maybe you've heard it, maybe you haven't. But the Bee Gees. Anybody ever heard of the Bee Gees? Oh, you have, really? Really? Well, long before they they were the disco Bee Gees with the falsettos, they actually had some decent music. And uh, one of the songs I remember, and I'm just going to tell you the title, okay, because the title really summed it up for me so well. It's very profound. Every once in a while, you know, a, a secular song can have a profound message. I'm just telling you, okay? And here's what it said, don't forget to remember. Don't forget to remember. Here's what that means to me. If you just count on remembering because it's out there, you're going to fall off the bicycle. You've got to make a point of not forgetting to remember. God, please don't let me forget this stuff because it's important. He says, you know, I'm... (laughs) I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. He said, I will wear you out if I have to, okay? But you're going to hear it from me, and you're going to hear it from me, and hear it from me until the day that they take me out and they crucify me like they did my Lord. I I, I have to keep reminding you. Remember what you believe about the gospel Remember that you were cleansed from your old sins. Don't forget it. Don't forget to remember it on a regular basis. I'm not just a Christian. I'm not just a church member. I'm a citizen of heaven 
saved by grace. I can't forget to remember that. And he says, remember where you got this from. I love this. In verse 16, this is Peter. Again, late in life, hey, you know how Peter was when he walked with the Lord. He didn't care what he said anyway, whether you like it or not. He was going to say what he had on his mind to say. That's just the way Peter was. I think that I might have been a little bit like Peter. But he, he said, okay, here it is. He said, we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now this is important, folks. This is really important. We didn't just sit down and write up a gospel. Peter's saying, look, I was there. I believe this stuff because I was there. I saw Jesus. I walked with Jesus. You know, on the night of Jesus' betrayal, I don't know who that kid is, but God bless you, son or daughter. I used to always say, hey, it's not mine. <laughs> don't quote me on that. Somebody out there is struggling, okay? We did not follow cleverly devised tales. We saw Jesus. Peter was there the night of Jesus' arrest. The Bible tells us very clearly that when Peter announced for the third time, I do not know the man. The Bible tells us this. Jesus looked right at him. Eye to eye. I don't think Peter ever forgot that one day of his life. We did not follow cleverly devised tales. You know, and I believe that Peter may have still been fighting a, a, a tradition that arose shortly after the resurrection. You know, uh, Jesus' resurrection was not supposed to happen. <laughs> he was sealed in a tomb, and there were guards posted. Okay, so there's no way he can get out. There's no way that they can get in. This is just not supposed to happen, and it happened anyway. God's kind of like that, you know. <laughs> And so the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 28 that Jesus has made a, an appearance uh, at the tomb. And then in verse 11, the Bible tells us, now while they were going, that was the, the, the women who had come to the tomb, and they, and they were going back to tell the disciples, you know, to, to go to Galilee and see Jesus. And so while they were going their way, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priest, not to the captain of the guard, notice, but to the chief priest. They go to the chief priest. And, and they came and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, here's the thing. And they said, okay, this is what happened. He's not there. We don't know what happened, but he's not there. The tomb is empty. These are Roman soldiers, okay? The one thing that they're not going to do is fall asleep on the job. They, are, they, would on their, they would fall on a sword before they would let a prisoner escape. That's just the way it is. Read it, it, uh, what happened uh, to the guard in the Philippian jail when he thought his prisoners had escaped. He's ready to lay down on his sword. You just don't do that kind of stuff. And they come and say, look, we can't explain it, but this is what happened. And we would love to think that the chief priest, the religious elite, would say, well, I guess we were wrong. Praise the Lord. But that's not what they did. It said when they had assembled together with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers. They bribed them. That's exactly what they did. They said, tell them that his disciples came at night and stole him away while, he, while you slept. Now, for a Roman soldier to be asleep on the job was a death sentence. Okay? You don't do that. He said, well, we'll give you enough money. But listen, they'll sweeten the pot. If it comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. In other words, we'll cover for you. Now, the Bible does not tell us what eventually happened. I don't think that these guys could cover for Roman soldiers saying they fell asleep on the job. But that's what they were offering them. And the Bible tells us, so they took the money and did as they were instructed, and this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Even until this day that Peter is writing this, people are still saying, oh, the disciples came and stole the body. 
Peter says, no, we did not follow cleverly devised tales. We saw it with our own eyes. I was there. He goes on to say in verse 17, he received from God, speaking of Jesus, we, he, he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Here he is clearly referring to the transfiguration. Peter, James, and John were the only ones that were, were with Jesus when he was transfigured. That's a very biblical word, but it simply means he was changed before their eyes. Uh, he, he took on his, I believe, he took on his holy identity. It was something that was supernatural. And there with him were Elijah and Moses. And we heard about Elijah this morning up on the mountain calling down fire from heaven. Remember that Moses also was on a mountain when he received the tablets from God. And Peter's saying, yeah, we were there on that mountain, and we saw Jesus with them. We saw this. I will not say that we didn't see what we saw. Now, that'll get you killed in Rome in the middle part of the first century. It'll get you killed in other parts of the world today. But he refused to back down. He said, this is what we saw. Now listen here. Peter is well aware, not only that he's about to pass away, he's also well aware that the number of people who were around Jesus and saw these things firsthand is dwindling. Firsthand witnesses are either being killed or dying off of natural causes. And in another generation, there will be nobody that can say, like Peter says, I was there. In a day, in a day and age when there wasn't electronic uh, uh, forms of communication and, and computers to store memories and that kind of stuff, first-hand testimony meant something. Second-hand testimony meant a lot. But he said, look, while I'm still here, while I still have breath, I'm going to tell you, don't forget this. I was there. It's real. This whole Christian thing, it's real. Don't forget. And he says, remember what the source of all this is. And in verse 19 he says this, So we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to take heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. We'll come back to that verse in just a moment. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is any private interpretation. For prophecy, listen, never came by the will of man. Biblical prophecy never came by the will of man. You can't make this stuff up. That's not biblical prophecy. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit moved people in the Old Testament, New Testament, and I believe in today's world to speak the prophetic word. He said, look, I'm, I'm telling you what I saw, and I'm telling you what the Bible says, and I'm telling you it's true. It's not just me saying it. It's God speaking through the Holy Spirit. Now, again, I said we'd go back to verse 19. We had the prophetic word confirmed which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Now, some uh, biblical scholars, they, they, they like to take that verse and, and say, well, he's, he's talking about revelation and He's talking about this kind of stuff. And, um, because it, we see the, the, the morning star rising in, in Revelation chapter 22 and that kind of stuff. But the, the, one of the things I learned in Bible college is, in, in, in our preaching classes, was if the plain, plain sense makes sense, it probably is the sense. And to me, it, it, it just makes sense what he's talking about. He said, the light has shined in a dark place. The world was a very dark place when Jesus came in. The world can be a very dark place for you and I today. When the Word of God intersects our human existence, it's a light that just breaks through. He says that light shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises. Where? In your hearts. When you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, something happened. When I accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, something happened and it was real. 
And this is what he's saying. He said, God has given us his holy word. Now, true, Peter was primarily talking about the Old Testament. We are beneficiaries of not just the Old Testament, but the New as well. We have Peter saying to us, I was there. It's real. It does count. And you have got to remember. When we get to the point where our Christianity becomes a comfortable form of religion, we have lost something. When we get to the point where we can go days and weeks and months at a time and not reflect on the fact that you who were once dead in your sins have been forgiven. We've lost something. I will not hesitate to remind you. The question is, do we want to be reminded? Because I'll say this, if we want to be reminded, we have got to take the initiative. Peter's not here anymore. The Bible is. Peter's words are still here. The Bible's still here. The Holy Spirit has not left planet Earth. I just want you to know that. If we want to be reminded on a regular basis of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we've got to make an effort on that, folks. Don't forget to remember. Well, I wish I'd have written a song. I could trademark. Let me wrap it up. I don't want your ice cream to melt. The Bible either is or it is not God's true word. Don't just say, oh, I believe the Bible, and not know what the Bible tells you to believe. The Bible is of divine origin. I believe that 100%. Peter believed it. It was good enough for Peter. It's good enough for me. Holy men of God spoke as they were led by the Holy Spirit. And that's why we have the Bible that we have. No other religion has a living, breathing Word of God like Christianity does. And I'm proud of that. The Bible as a book is not to be worshipped. But it is to be honored and respected. And I honor my Bible. I will tell you the couple, you know, and this may seem silly to some people. I don't like to put my Bible on the floor. I don't like, when I'm walking into church, if you see me walking in, and yes, I have an iPad, okay? It's got my sermon outline on it. I read from the Bible. But when you see me walking into church, it's going to be like this, never the other way around. The Bible takes priority. We should honor the Bible Certainly treat it respectfully, but more important than that, reading it faithfully. And when I say read it, I mean read it with the intent of hearing what God has to speak to you on any given day at any given passage or whatever. We're not making a check mark. We're trying to find out what God wants to tell us. Read it faithfully. Meditate on it seriously. Meditating is a, a kind of a lost art in America. We don't meditate on hardly anything. Because our minds go from one thing to another pretty quickly. And we just don't spend much time meditating on anything. You know, I don't know about you, some people have a hard time with silence. Silence can be deafening, you know what I'm talking about? I don't hear, i got to have the TV on, I just need some noise on in the background. I just, you know, if, if there's nothing going on and I'm just left alone with my thoughts, I don't know what I would do. Well, I, I don't have a problem with silence. Now, I love music. And I like to listen to music. I love my wife, and I love to listen to my wife. And she really loves to listen to me. I just want you to know that. She drove a thousand miles so she could hear me preach tonight. Broke down in Ozark and still made it. I want you to know that's a woman right there. I'll hear about it when I get home. Trust me. Meditating just simply means... When you're reading God's Word and something you don't understand, 
Reflect on it. Don't just say, oh, well, that was nice. Oh, well, I don't know what that means. Reflect on it. Or if something that you read jumps out at you. This morning, I, I did have the privilege of teaching Sunday school, uh, and, and I did enjoy that. And, and, and the, the lesson that I brought this morning, because I had free reign, I love it when I get free reign. <laughs> uh, I said, teach me anything you want to, just stay out of Revelation. Okay, well, I could do that. And I, the, the lesson that I brought this morning came because something in God's Word jumped out at me. It should happen. I mean, that should happen. That should be natural, right? So read it faithfully. Meditate on it seriously. Pray for God to apply it in our lives continuously. What? Yes. I don't want to just read this and say, okay, I feel like a better person now. We ought to read it with the intent of applying it. Now, when you... Some people never read instructions. I know that. I'm tired of people saying that men never read instructions. That's not true. I'm a man, and I read instructions, okay? And I want you to know I'm really good at putting stuff together most of the time, okay? Here's the thing. If you're going to read the instructions, you better put it together the way the instructions say. And that's the same thing with the Bible. If you're going to read the instructions, you better put your life together the way the instructions read. And of course, the other thing is we need to share it with others freely. It didn't cost me anything. Share, share the gospel, share the Bible with other people that need to hear it. We, we, we have to simply be at the point where we remember who we are where we have come from, where we are going, and, and never lose sight of these things. Because life can get busy. I know that. It gets busy for me too. But don't forget to remember. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray, Father, that you would apply it to our hearts and minds and help us to always, always approach your word humbly and hungrily to live our lives in a manner that pleases you so that we might grow more and more in the image of Jesus. For we pray in his name. Amen.